Before we get into tonight's story, I'd just like to know I take this time to thank you. Thank you everyone for 50 subscribers. My goal has been met and now my new goal is to reach 100. And to be honest, I wouldn't have reached this goal without you guys. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart and I hope you continue with me on this journey as I reach to the top and hopefully technically be a somebody here. But for now, I'm your somebody. And, tonight, and thank you for everything and on to the night story. Consider this a warning. In the events that it ever comes to you during a moment of weakness, as it did to me all those years ago, say no to the pastel man. It doesn't matter how much you love that person that it promised to help. Nothing is worth what it wants in return. I tell you this in hopes that you don't make the same mistakes I did that cold winter night, kneeling beside my father's withering body on the living room floor. It was 1997 when I first encountered the creature, and ever since not a day has gone by where its awful face hasn't haunted my thoughts. It was a teen I was a teenager then, but I looked at the evening at the night my childhood died, corrupted and violated by a Collius hell beast with pale blue skin. Even though it happened years ago, I still remember the event of that fateful first encounter vividly. I could tell you what my father and I were wearing, the topic of the pizza we were eating, even the score on the football game playing on the TV. It was around halftime when my father's speech started to become slurred, which I find odd since it has been nursing the same bottle of beer since kickoff. Stranger even, I had seen him drink a six pack to himself in the past without even appearing tipsy, so I was having trouble understanding how a single drink could have such an effect on him. I realized it wasn't the alcohol when half of his body went limp and he slid off the couch. I asked him if he was alright, but his words had now become incomprehensible. I grabbed the phone off the coffee table and dialed 911. 911, what's your emergency? I think my dad is having a stroke! The thought of him of only crossed my mind a second before the operator answered the phone. Okay, we have your address. An ambulance is on its way. It should be there soon. Is he conscious? Yes, he is. But I can't understand him. Nonsensical je jabbles sound were rambling out of my father's mouth. I was afraid. I was af He was all I had. M my mother passed away when I was a baby, so I never got the chance to know her. But my dad was always there for me. Doing a job of two parents, if I lost him, then I would be alone. That's normal. With strokes, it's good that he's always awake. And I didn't hear the rest of the, or the rest because that's when I dropped the phone. I was having one of those moments where everything faded into the background while my world fell silent. The football game playing on the television, the operator giving me the instructions over the phone. Even the sound of my father's voice was as he wailed in agony on the carpet because became white noise, dissolving into the air as I lost all awareness of my surroundings. All of my attention was focused now on one thing. The horrible abomination that was standing in my kitchen, watching my father, I, and with a twisted smile across its disgusting face. Its head nearly misses scrape, scrape against our kitchen it's nine feet ceiling as it shifted from the side to side, fidgeting with anticipation like a giddy child in the class of the last day of school, waiting for that final bell to, to signal summer vacation. The pastel blue skin that covered its entire body, from the creature's head all the way down to its feet, horrible, grimy feet, looked withered and wrinkled like leather and it had, it had been out in the sun for all day. Hanging off its long, lanky frame was a plain brown satchel with black stitches. It lightly caressed the straps of the pouch of his long fingers when it looked at him with eagerness and expression on its face. At first I thought I had gone mad from the sight of seeing my father having a stroke. But the closer the, the monstrosity slicked towards us, the more I realized that it was no hallucination. It ducked its head under the 
of the light fixtures of the living room and the step spreadly, spreadly legs over the couch. Through the monstrous freak of nature was clearly bibital. It had moved down all fours and appeared to be stalking us like some wild animal hunting its prey. I should have been terrified, but the horrible smile on its god-awful face made me feel more anger towards the thing than fear. It was as if it was taking pleasure in my father's misery. Clo closer still it crept, and I grabbed my father's hand in desperation to some veiled attempt to protect him. The creature stopped its face mere inches from mine before shifting its attention down to my father. I can save him, if you like. I was taken aback. I had prepared for the terrible thing to take a chunk of flesh out of my neck with its teeth or, or, or slash me across the face with its black, crusty nails, but speaking to me was the last thing I expected. He's dying, but I can save him. If you'd like. I sat there, mouth agape, cradling my father's head in my arms and, st and staring with his two pink bulbous eyes that took up more than the third of its foul thing's face. I remember thinking that it reminded me of Easter eggs, a bizarre connection to my mind to make giving the situation. It took back up to two feet and once again I was reminded just how imposing the creature really was. It told me its name, which I dared not repeat because it also explains the speaking of its best way to summon the beast. For the, for the remainder of my story, I will refer to the entity as the Pastel Man. Just a name I came up with due to the pigment of its skin and the light shade of pink that it was colored in its eyes. That and for some reason giving the creature's silly name always helped me make me feel less afraid of it. Not much less in not much less though. Finally my mind had recovered enough from the shock to allow me to stutter out a few words. What do you mean you can save him? What I do is make deals, young man. His voice was surprisingly angelic, like a thousand chores all singing in unison. If one were to close their eyes while the creatures spoke to them, they might imagine they were listening to a seraph, not a hideous monster that was sporting a depraved grin by, in my living room. However, its extraordinary voice was managing to make me feel more unease. It wasn't right that something so, that something so beautiful would belong to such a, such a repulsive creature. The pastel man gestured to its satchel. I have the ability to save your father's life, but you have to agree to a deal with me. What kind of deal? Everything happens for a reason, even death. His mischievous smile widened just a bit as if the creature was getting to a punchline of a joke. It's true that I can save your father's life, but someone must die in, the, in his place. One shall die, so another may live. That's the deal. I clutched my chest. Not you. What would be the point? No, I'm giving you the option to choose the person who you want to replace your father this evening. I was stunned by what I was hearing. Are you death? The pastel man threw its head back in yet at a terrible howl. It was only later that I would have come to a realization that was how the wretched thing laughed. No. <laughs> I'm certainly not the Grim Reaper, although you are not the first person to ask me that. I'm not the devil either, nor do I work for him. Let's just say I'm an independent contractor, shall we? Two tiny holes that lied in the center of its face is an absent of nose flared dissatisfaction of its explanation. I can choose anyone? Well, not anyone. That wouldn't be, that wouldn't be very fun now, would it? I could see a row of shark-like teeth hiding in its mouth as it separated its lips to speak. Your father's replacement must be someone else in your life. I'm not a murderer. My voice was tiny. It barely escaped my mouth. I looked back to my father. He had lost consciousness and his skin was becoming pale. And I don't think I could kill anyone I know. You don't have to murder anyone, young man. The sly creature was moving in its final pitch. 
all that you have to do is tell me who it is you want dead, and I will do the rest. Surely there must be someone you would have mind out of your life. A teacher, an ex-girlfriend, a rival at school, perhaps? There was. I have fantasized about it many times, but never in my wildest dreams would I ever had acted on it. Everyone has the person in their life who is toxic. Someone who makes me get up, makes get up in the morning more difficult, and it was certainly no exception. Walter Flanagan. I muttered under my breath. Who? Walter Flanagan. He's the guy in the school that gave me this. I looked at my shirt and showed, and showed the hampered shaped bruise on my chest that Walter had given me during one of those infamous hazing sessions in the locker room earlier this week. He's been shoving me into lockers and beating me up ever since I was a freshman. The faculty doesn't do anything since he's the best football player in the history of our school. He's a five-star recruit who is going to do huge college next year. ESPN even did a piece on him. Ah! The pastel man begins to snicker to itself. I somehow widen its already enormous pink eyes even more, then crotch back into the down face to face with me again. What fun is being a king without serfs to torment, eh? Well, I'm tired of being tormented, so just go and kill him before I change my mind. The pastel man shot a massive hand at him and wrapped his long fingers around my face. The grin that I was wearing since I first laid eyes on it now, be, now was replaced with a scowl. You don't tell me what to do! Are we clear? I nodded sheepishly. The grip it had on my face was so tight, I understood then and there that if it wanted to, the creature could easily snap my neck and crush my skull like an egg. Good. Because it's not so simple, young man. There are steps that must be taken. Steps? Yes. A playful smirk once again returned to the pastel man's face. You will have to be present when Walter Flanagan dies. In fact, I need you to summon me or else I can't complete my end of the bargain. Get the boy alone and speak my name. You must watch him die by sunrise or else you will be violating the terms of your agreement. So, do we have a deal? I nodded again and the monster released its hold on my face before snatching my hand. Its giant paw swallowed my palm as we shook to the cement to decrement the deal. Excellent! With this handshake, our deal is binding, young man. I watched curiously as the pastel man reached into the satchel and fumbled around until it found what it was looking for. It's been a is between its repugnant fingers. It had a strange-looking insect about the size of a quarter. The bug buzzed in his wings and attempted to flutter away, but could only not it, but could not escape the pastel man's grasp. With its other hand, it pushes down on my father's jaw in order to open its mouth. What are you doing? I asked, the, I asked, but the pastel man didn't answer. It then violently stuck the insect down my father's throat, jamming it down its, its esophagus with its filthy fingers. The pastel man rose once more to its feet. There, the deed is done. Your father will recover in full. Now it's your turn. Remember. The boy dies by sunlight, or the deal is off. It turned its back to me and began to slither away. What if I change my mind? I asked. The creature stopped almost mid-stride and twisted around. Again, its smile had been something to leave by an awful sneer. I felt even less safe when it was, was holding my face in the vice grip earlier. Your father's health has already been restored, so someone must replace him. One must die, so another shall live. That was the deal. If you fail to complete your end of the bargain, then so that someone will be you. Believe me when I say this, young man. I don't need to be summoned once our deal has been broken. I will come for you. That is a promise. And when I do, you're going to wish you never crossed me. With that, it continued out the kitchen and through the back door. I chased after it, but the, by the time I got outside into the backyard, the thing had disappeared. It was then I spotted the lights of the ambulance as I pulled up across the street from my house. I flagged down the EMTS and led them to my father. It wasn't difficult to find Walter. I knew exactly where he was going to be, but I had completely lost track of the time while waiting to hear from my father's doctors in the ICU. I had to hurry to Eddie Gillen's house. 
Eddie's parents were out of town and had to be and talking all week at, at school about it. The rager has planned on throwing. There was two things I knew about Walter. One, Eddie was his best friend. Two, he never missed a party. It was somewhere around 3.30 in the morning when I pulled up to my car to Eddie's. I parked a little way down the street so I wouldn't be spotted. Because I had gotten held up in the hospital, I feared that I had missed my chance to catch Walter. My concerns were, were relieved when I saw a raised to pickup truck still parked in the driveway. Another thought crossed my mind. What if Walter had gotten too drunk and passed out? I, I tried to think of a way to get into Eddie's and, and get Walter alone long enough for the pastel man to do whatever it had planned. Luckily for me, it wasn't too long before Walter stumbled out of the Eddie's front door and climbed into the truck. I let out a sigh, having just escaped a potential challenging problem. He pulled out and I followed behind, staying far enough away so that he wouldn't tip him off. He was drunk. Even from the distance I could tell I was, I was tailing him, I could see his truck swerving in and out of its lane. The pastel man's otherworldly voice played itself over and over like a heavily broken record in my mind. You must watch him die by sunrise. I wonder if I had the courage to summon the creature again. Seeing it once in the that night was traumatic enough. I couldn't really handle looking into the horrible face for a second time. And what about Walter? Even though he was a huge ass, he didn't deserve to die and certainly not in the hands of that thing. It will kill you if you don't let it kill him. Just remember, you're doing this for dad. I'm not sure if it was a little angel on my shoulder or the little devil that was whispering in my ear. I looked out on the driver's side window, a pink ribbon line and horizon. The very first sign of sunlight making its presence known in the dark evening sky. In a couple of hours, morning would arrive, and I would be too late to complete my end of the bargain. I would see the pastel men again, one way or another. Walter lived up at the foothills outside of town where some of the well, more wealthier people owned homes. I had been there once for a school project, one where I did all the work, and he ended up taking the credit. We had come to the part of the road where, leading towards its house, had to cut through the wooden area. I knew there would be no houses for a stretch, so I decided that was the way I would make my move. I sped up until I was tailgating the truck, then, then started flashing my blights and honking my horn. I was prepared to rear-end him in order to get him to stop driving, but I didn't even take it to get the job done. He must have panicked. His truck started to swerve violently across the street before running off-road, side-whipping a, a tree and coming to a complete stop. I pulled up behind him and then hesitated for a moment. A glimpse of the creature's grin flashed through my mind, causing me to shudder. I got out of the car, but left the engine running and my headlights on. Hey, Walter! I shouted. Walter's door jerked open and he jumped out the truck of the ground below. Sean the Shithead? He was confused but clearly annoyed. Sean the Shithead was the nickname he had occasionally given me in my second week of school. Within a month, he had the entire class calling me it. You think this thing was funny? I'm gonna fuck you up, you little bitch. He stormed towards me in the first with his both fists clenched. Again, doubts across my mind about whether or not I could pull the trigger. Guilt began to pump through my veins. Walter's life was about to end, and it was going to be because of me. Memories darted through my consciousness. All the after-school beatings I took in the hands of Walter, the pastel man's wicked smile. It looked at my father's face as he kicked and screamed on the living room floor. Finally, those words spoken through the unnervingly angelic voice of that terrible monster. One must die, so another shall live. Walter was moving closer. It was now or never. I had to choose whether or not I could summon the beast before the decision was out of my hands. I shouted the pastel man's real name out of the burst of emotions amid directly towards the football star. Walter paused for a moment, looking at me in confusion, then recollect himself and proceeded towards me again. The pastel man was nowhere to be seen. For the second time that evening, I wondered if I had gone insane. Could everything that had happened to me in, at night been in my head? Was it real? Was my father even sick? Again, I repeated the thing's name in the effort to summon it, but the time it did nothing it to hinder Walter's pursuit of me. 
He violently shoved me against the hood of my car, grabbed hold of my shirt collar, and spun me around. Walter raised his fist to hit me. I winced and put my hands up in order to prepare for impact, but it never struck me. It only when I opened my eyes that I realized I wasn't crazy. Walter's face was white. His mouth hung open just as mine had when I first caught sight of the pastel man earlier that evening. I turned my head to see that unmistakably long, lanky body slick out of the shadows and in front of my car's headlights. Its face still worse than that warped smile, and I knew just beyond those thin lips of a mouth full of tiny daggers capable of tearing muscle from bone. Neither Walter nor I said a word. I think I might have been almost as terrified as him. My stomach began to feel sick as the pastel man stalked even closer. I didn't look at Walter's face. How could I? The boy was about to die at the hands of the horrible monster and it was my fault. I didn't have to summon it. I didn't have to shake its hand. I'm sorry. I truly was and I still am. I hadn't taken my eyes off the pastel man, but I think it had more to do with not being able to look at Walter in the face than fear for my life. Walter said nothing. My car's headlights fell on the creature's face and now he was he could both see it clearly. The pastel man's large pink eyes seemed to glow bright in the light of the headlamps. Walter let go of me and made it a brake first truck, but the hell beast pounced on him with a surprising amount of speed and agility that I had not yet seen in demonstration. He screams. He were met with the only empathy from the creature as it dug through its filthy black fingernails into Walter's abdomen. I tried to look away, but the pastel man made sure I remembered our agreement. You must watch, young man. Don't forget we had a deal. I forced myself to look back at the massacre. The creature smiled had it mutated into a mischievous to depraved. It looked as if it was deraving some sort of sick sexual pleasure of torturing it was putting Walter through. Deeper still, it burrowed its long, bony fingers into Walter's stomach. With a jerk of heinous things, yanked out a handful of its intestines and dragged them across the ground as it approached me. Flared those holes in his face that filled in the nose, clearly pleased with its handiwork. It's over then? I'm not sure if I was acting or begging the creature that the two face of us face each other at the empty street that night. The pastel man threw its head back, once again let out a revolting howl. Over? We're just getting started! It handed back over towards Walter, who at this point was crawling along the ground, still trying to get, this, get to his truck while his innards trailed behind him. The pastel man cut him off and snatched him off the appellate, easily lifting him with his, by the head with one hand. It toyed with him for a bit, forcing Walter to look into the hideous face. When its free hand, with, with his free hand, the creature reaches into the satchel and pulled out a much bigger insect this time. It was different than the one my father had unknowingly ingested, both in size and in appearance. If the bug that the creature jammed down my father's throat was the size of a quarter, then this one was, was much larger as the size of a golf ball. It was slimy, the mucus-like membrane was, ceasing, was creasing in his glisten of my car's headlights. The pastel man dangled the nasty bug in front of Walter's face for a few seconds. Now be a good boy and open your mouth. Walter screamed. That gave the blue beast its opening it needed. It thrusted the slimy insect in its mouth and passed its tonsils with its filthy fingers. I watched as Walter gagged, presumably on the oversized maggot and had made its way down his throat. Soon he began to turn blue. I could tell he was choking to death and even though I wanted to save him, there was nothing I could do. A minute later, the pastel man dropped his lifeless body to the ground. It examined the carnage for a moment pondering over if it was a masterpiece of an art gallery. Then the demon turned away, retreating back towards the shadows and disappeared into the night without saying a word. I stood there at the road, looking at the scene and still feel sick to my stomach from what I just witnessed. I don't know what, to, what I expected to happen after the deed was done. There was no explosion, no brilliant light showing where I would watch Walter's soul either drag down to hell or ascend upwards towards the heavens. 
just a dead body in the road. A dead boy and his murderer. The pastel man was the gun, but I pulled the trigger. In a way, there was two dead boys in the road that evening. I knew that I didn't have time to dwaddle, and the moment the car could have come drive down the street and find me standing in the middle of the massacre, I sprinted back to my car and sped down the street towards town. The coroner attributed Walter's death to the drinking and driving accident, although there was a under understandably a lot of suspicion regarding the odd circumstances surrounding his demise. The autopsy revealed no evidence of the slimy bug in the pastel man had placed in Walter's throat. The town was devastated. I remembered a candlelight vigil and held in its honor. A couple of big news outlets covered his death because of Walter's status as an elite college football recruit. My father made a full recovery, and just a couple of days after, his stroke was released from the hospital. I would go on to graduate high school and meet the love of my life in the very first semester at my university. Her name was Diane, and she was the most beautiful girl I have ever seen. We married shortly after college, settled down, and had a wonderful boy named Matthew. However, I never forget the hand I played in Walter's death. I had carried that guilt with me since the event of that night. No matter how much I wanted to, I couldn't forget. The pastel man wouldn't let me. It must, I must have seen him an easy patsy because the creature had come to me again and again every time a loved one has been on the brink of death offering me the same deal I accepted the first the first shameful night through the creature it had been persistent in his pursuit of bloodlust the Im the image of Walter's gruesome death never left my mind and gave me the strength to say no to his proposition even years later on the eve of my father's passing I was able to refuse its proposal when the pastel man visited me in the hospital room I've been cursed to have my soul tested till the day that I die by the pastel man. A test that for years I was able to preserve through until one evening where my life began to crumble da crumbling down and once more the creature took advantage of me in a moment of weakness. Diane and Matthew were in their way back from the airport after visiting my in-laws. I was swamped at work and I had to pull an all-nighter in order to finish a project that had deadlines so my wife hailed a taxi rather than ask me to pick them up. It was around midnight and I was alone in the office when I got a call from the police department. They told me a drunk driver had collided with the cab and the highway was coming back from the airport. My wife and the cabbie were killed on impact and my son was in critical condition. I sat there at my desk, unable to move or formulate a cohesive thought. It was that then I realized that it wasn't by myself in the office anymore. Perched on top my boss desk was the pastel man. The abhorred smile still painted across its nasty, wrinkled face. I didn't need to make an offer. This, I believe, the creature already knew. Can you save him? Can you save them? I asked. Yes and no. What do you mean? Just spit it out. The pastel mill smirk disappeared, and I could tell that it was not pleased by with the tone of my voice. Memories of the vast the vice grip it had on my face the night, the last time I demanded something from the creature, bled into my consciousness. Perhaps it realized it, I was past the point of threats because instead of lunging at me as the creature had done in the past, it decided to clarify its cryptic response. I cannot pull someone back from death's clutches. Only save them be before it gets a hold of them. Your wife is dead. Now make your peace with that. Your son's life, on the other hand, can be salvaged. For a price, of course. I racked my mind. I couldn't think a single person in my life who deserved to die at the hands of that pale blue monstrosity. Even someone as an awful as Walter didn't deserve that gruesome fate he had received that night due to my poor decisions. But my son was all I had now, and he didn't deserve to die either. Not because someone else had made a poor decision that evening and got behind the wheel of a car they were too intoxicated to drive. The pastel man's glorious voice filled the room again. I seemed to have hearing it from all directions. The drunk driver that crashed into your family's cab is still alive, and in the very same hospital as your son. 
why not him? For the first time in that evening, I looked at the large pink eyes of the creature. You said it had to be someone I know. Some mystics. I just needed somebody who was directly impacted your life. The moment he drove into your car, drove into your wife and son's taxi, he became a candidate. The pastel men flared his tiny holes in its face with glee that the way it always did when it was connected with itself. Fine, let's do this. I said I shook his giant hand to, to make an arrangement official, and what the pastel man gave me was instructions to complete our deal. When I met with the doctor at the hospital, they updated me on my condition on my son. We've done all we can, but he's a fighter. The doctor's frightened optimism, but I could see in his eyes that they didn't expect him to make it through the night. They led me to his room and gave me some time alone with him. The pastel man was already there when I entered, smiling down on his broken body. Quickly, I shut the door behind me and nodded to the creature. It reached a grangly arm into the satchel and pulled out the same type of strange looking insect and it shoved down my father's throat. I opened Matthew's mouth and with two gobbly fingers the creature crammed the, deep, the bug deep into his oral cavity. He will make a full recovery. Now it's your turn. The pastel man waltzed behind the hospital curtains to in my son's room. I knew I didn't have to check to see if he had disappeared. If it were to make another appearance at the hospital that evening, then it would be because I spoke its name. When I agreed to the bargain at my, off, at my office, the pastel man had told me what room the driver was being kept in. His injuries were far less severe than Matthew's, so he was in a different wing of the facility. I could feel my heart pounding as I made my way towards his room. With each step, the beating in my chest grew louder. Already, the same feeling of guilt I had felt while I was looking down at Walter's corpse laying in the middle of the road washed over me. I was about to take another person's life. Who was I to decide whether someone deserves to live or die? I felt just as ugly and horrible as the pastel man looked. Maybe I didn't have pointed teeth or wrinkly blue skin, but, I, but if I knew that I, I went with our deal, then I was just as big as a monster as it was. I, slept, I stepped stealthily as possible to the door, hoping no one would notice me sneak in and I looked down at the face of the driver lying unconscious in his bed. I instantly felt the familiar sickness in my stomach. He was a boy, no older than Walter that night, and the pastel man and myself unfairly snuffed out his life before I truly had the chance to shine. Walter could have become someone different when he matured, someone capable of doing real good in this world, but he never was given that chance of or the opportunity this driver was just a stupid teenager who made a mistake. One that he never get the chance to atone for. I saw Walter in the boy's face and my stomach began to churn more. I tried to call out the pastel man's name, but I couldn't. Perhaps that little angel on my shoulder wouldn't allow me. I would not be responsible for the death of another boy. Not this time. I refused to pull the trigger. I walked out of his room and didn't look back. I spent the rest of that evening sitting next to my son's bed. The first few rays of morning sunlight snuck into Matthew's hospital room and caught my attention. I peeked out through the blinds and watched the sun rise at the first time since the night Walter died. It was beautiful. The pink ribbon that lined in the horizon had bled into the sky, creating a dazzling purple hue. I had my light show, and it was spectacular. I broke my deal with the pastel man, and doing so, my fate now rests in his filthy hands. Hands that I likely plan on burying into my abdomen. On the plus side, my son will recover in full. It will be hard for him growing up without his parents, but he always been close with his aunt. My wife's sister is a wonderful woman with a caring family. She is a godmother and promised us to on the day he was born that he would always be there for him. Her husband does well for himself, and they never had a problem with money. The life insurance policy Diana and I took out, 
out combined with the money he had been putting away for Matthew to go to college will ensure that he should have be no financial issues while he is under their care. It's only a matter of time before the past of mine comes for me. I had accepted my death is near, but I'm not scared. In a way, I looked forward to it. It's almost as if the boy that died within me on that horrible night had been given another chance. When I die, all the guilt and hate that I had for myself dies with me, wiped away so that my soul can cross over to this new planes of existence, pure and innocent. The way it was before, I never met that monster. One must die, so another shall live. That's what the pastel man said.